everybody. Welcome back to Fertility Factor Fiction and happy April. We are moving towards Valentine's Day. So all those of you with a significant other, happy uh, early Valentine's. And I'm going to ask you guys for some help because I do not know what to do for my wife this year. So during the discussion tonight, I want loads of ideas for what to do for the missus. Um, who I love dearly and need some help this year. So I figured, hey, we've got lots of followers. Maybe some of you guys can help us out. So if you have a great idea for Valentine's Day, uh, let us know and we'll uh, definitely uh, post whatever we think we're gonna do. Um, just don't say jewelry because I can't afford to get her any jewelry this year. <laughs> um, so she got a little bit already. So we've got a great topic tonight. Uh, we always get asked about the impact of your uh, body mass index on your success rate when you're doing fertility treatments, in particular for IVF. And a lot of people are told, unfortunately, in very uh, insensitive terms that they should just go lose some weight. And that's really difficult for a lot of people to hear. And we don't want to have people have to go through that. So uh, we've figured why not kind of share the data on this. And a great new study is coming out where they reviewed a huge number of other studies all compiled together. They had almost a million patients or a million cycles that people had done. And they examined the relationship between their body mass index only in studies that had controlled for other confounding factors and then came up with kind of a model or a predictive model for clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate and miscarriage. So I thought it was important to share that data with you so we can kind of define where the limits are, what's true, what's not true. Does body mass index actually have an impact? Because it's not fair to tell patients, hey, just go lose some weight. And if you are going to tell them that they need to reduce their body mass index, then you need to give them justification for it. So the question was, is there a justification for it? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So hopefully in the meantime, while everybody's jumping on board, uh, you're all staying safe. I hope you're all wearing your masks. For those of you that have had the opportunity to get the vaccine, definitely do so. Uh, brand new data came out day before yesterday, yesterday, I believe, which showed that the antibodies to COVID do pass from mom to the infant through the placenta, which means that taking the COVID vaccine will protect your baby because the baby will be born with the antibodies to the COVID vaccine. So that can be very helpful for the baby. We're still not seeing any, uh, any kind of significant risks from taking the vaccine in pregnant patients. And there is no risk other than sort of a more severe nature of the illness in women that get actual COVID virus. So if you have that chance to get vaccinated, please do so. It is much safer for you and for your child. But if you are getting vaccinated and you're trying to conceive, they do recommend that you wait six to eight weeks between the time that you took your first shot and the time that you start trying to conceive. So if you're getting vaccinated, we will put about a two month block in there before you do your IVF. Check out our YouTube video, link is right there on the COVID vaccine. And we're actually gonna update it hopefully this week with another new video that Tarek and I will work on on the weekend. So let's get started. So the name of this article is a non-linear dose response relation of female body mass index and in vitro fertilization outcomes. So big disclaimer right from the outset, and that is that this study mainly looked at women. And there is no question that we know that men also have a significant role to play and that their body mass index does have a significant role as well. And some somebody actually astutely paid attention to the questions and they asked about that already and I think I put a, a response up. So uh, if you're male and you are obese, you definitely have a decline in your sperm performance. You'll have extra estrogen levels, lower testosterone levels. We see differences in morphology and motility in sperm count. Uh, frequently there's excessive heat that can be quite damaging. There's DNA fragmentation parameters that can be altered. So the miscarriage rates can be higher, the fertilization rates can be lower, implantation can be lower. So uh, this talk by no means is designed to isolate the women or pick on the women whatsoever. In fact, um, guys have an equally important role. Unfortunately, we don't have as much data on men, but there is no question that uh, guys need to reduce their weight, eat healthy, monitor their diet, um, watch their social habits, 
if they are part of this process. So make sure that your guys or partners are doing all of the right things that they need to in order to maximize their sperm. And a big part of that is reducing weight if that's part of their journey. Um, so for the women, this study actually took other studies that had previously been done and they amalgam amalgamated them into sort of a meta-analysis to see what the results would be. And they broke it down into studies that exclusively were cohort studies. So they were following large populations of women going through IVF, and this was exclusive to IVF. And then they analyzed them based on five unit increments. So sort of 20 to 25, uh, 26 to 30, and then 30 to 35, or 31 to 35, and then higher. And they also analyzed it um, exclusively based on certain uh, criteria. So the study went for articles that were from 1988 to March 2020. So that was really important. So it's an up-to-date study. They're including as much data as they possibly can. And they wanted to see cohort-based studies that evaluated the association between BMI and IVF, original articles that reported independently derived data. They reported the number of cases and controls for at least three or more BMI categories. And then they reported adjusted relative risks, which means that they controlled for the confounding factors and they put them in there. <clears throat> and they had confidence intervals uh, in there as well. Uh, and so they looked at all of those and if they saw studies that didn't have those criteria, then they excluded them. So this is pretty robust data because the numbers that they're getting are quite strong because the data selection process is quite stringent. So they actually started with a huge number of studies, which is usual with an, any meta-analysis. Um, there were 713, and by the time they end it, they're down from 713 to just 18 studies. Uh, but at the end of the day, these were 18 very well done studies, and they had selected out all of the other ones that weren't critical enough or meeting the criteria. So we're going to pop up a uh, table two, and this will actually be a relatively short talk tonight because there's all the data kind of crammed into table two. So I want to review table two with you. So the first thing we're going to look at is the clinical pregnancy rate. So when you look at the clinical pregnancy rate, for every five unit increment in BMI increase above 20 to 25, they saw a 5% decrease in clinical pregnancy rate, rate. So if you're in that sort of overweight category, 26 to 30 or 25 to 30, you're looking at a 5% decrease. If you went from 31 to 35, that would be a 10% decrease. And then if you went from 35 and above, you would see a 15% decrease in success. When they looked at this broken down into fresh embryos versus frozen embryos, because some people say, well, it doesn't matter as much with frozen versus fresh. They thought maybe the fresh is impacted, but the frozen is not. And there is actually some data to suggest that. These guys actually showed in a very highly statistical, uh, statistically significant fashion that that's actually not the case. It's 4% lower with fresh and it's 5% lower with frozen. So it's still very significant. And then they broke it down based on the source of the eggs, whether it was the patient's own eggs or they were using a donor cycle. And this is kind of novel data. I'd never seen this before in terms of a, a large scale study like this, looking at donor eggs because some patients are just worried about the look of the donor or if they like the donor, if it's a known donation, but you do need to take their body mass index into account because here again, in a very, very highly statistically significant number, they demonstrated a 4% decrease if it's your own eggs and a five or, or a 6% sorry decrease if it was the eggs of a donor. So that means by the time the donor is in a sort of more obese category, you're looking at up to a 12 to 18% decrease in the success rate. So that's very substantial. Our donor program has an extraordinarily high success rate and we don't wanna see that go down. So we are strict about the body mass index and that's important for our donor agencies to know as much as it is for our, our patients to know because when you're selecting the donor, we need to make sure they're picking the right person for you. So then we can switch over to live birth. That's always the holy grail of all things IVF. You should be seeing that up there now. And in the live birth category, it's an even higher impact. So it's a 7% decrease overall for every five 
unit increments in your body mass index. When you looked at fresh embryo transfers, it was 5%. When you looked at frozen embryo transfers, it's a 9% alteration in your success rate. So that means if your body mass index is over 35, you're looking at up to a 27% or greater decline in your success rate compared to women who are in the normal body mass index range. So this is very, very important to pass on to people, especially considering those who are doing a frozen embryo transfer. In large part, this would apply to our PCOS women who struggle with their weight. They're gonna need to pay particular attention to this because they may make tons of embryos, but we often have to freeze them in order to avoid a hyperstimulation syndrome uh, scenario and to get the embryos placed into a, a frozen prepared endometrium where the risk of hypertensive disorders, growth restriction is smaller. In those situations though, if they are dealing with a battle with their weight or their body mass index, you are looking at this very significant decline in success. Again, when they broke it down into donor versus the autologous or your own eggs, autologous had a 5% decrease the donors had that 9% decline. So very, very significant numbers and really important to see. When they looked at miscarriage, miscarriage again is very, very interesting to look at. So this is again, fairly novel data. We've always known that body mass index has an association, but they were really able to break this down very nicely into the different categories again, which is super important for you guys to know about. So overall, a 9% increase in miscarriage rate for every five unit increment. So again, compared to your normal body mass index, when you're going from the normal range up into overweight, you're looking at a 9% increase in your risk of, of miscarriage. When you go from overweight to obese, you're looking at an 18%. And then when you go from obese to morbidly obese, or the class three obesity, you're now looking at patients who are getting a 27%. So that's almost between a quarter to a third decrease in your success rate, or sorry, your miscarriage rate when you are struggling with your weight and it's, it's quite elevated. They again broke it down into the embryo transfer strategy. So if it's fresh, it's 7%. If it is a frozen embryo transfer, and your body mass index is elevated, it is a 17% increase in your miscarriage rate based on your five unit increment of the body mass index. So this is very, very drastic because this means that for women who are struggling with their weight, going into a frozen embryo transfer, you're looking at a 50% decrease in your success rate once you are into the morbidly obese category if you're doing a frozen embryo transfer. So these are patients where we really need to work with you to try and adjust that before we get you to the embryo transfer and ideally even before the egg retrieval to maximize your success rate and give you a much better chance than you would otherwise have. So huge, huge changes in miscarriage, 50% increase in your miscarriage rate. When they looked at this in terms of fresh, or sorry, your own versus donor, 7% um, for your own per five unit increase and 6% if it was a donor. So that part didn't really change whether it was the donor or the um, autologous, the patient's own eggs. And what that means, which is critically important is, this is not an egg issue because even with the donor eggs, we're seeing the same impact. This is a problem with either the hormonal milieu or your endometrium that is being impacted by whatever impact the body mass index has. Now, somebody asked, again, very astutely, great question and, and kudos to you. What happens if your weight is on the thin side? And we actually had someone that reported that her body mass index was only 15. So first of all, if your body mass index is 15, technically speaking, you're anorexic. And I don't mean you have the eating disorder, although that might be the case. But what I mean is that category is called anorexic. So that is way too low. You are putting a huge strain on your heart, your kidneys, your adrenal glands. That is completely unsafe for anybody to be struggling with. You actually need to get immediate help if your body mass index is that low. And we know, and I've presented this before and talked about it many times, that if your body mass index is lower than 18.5, which is the lower limit of normal for, for normal body mass index, that those patients don't do as well. In fact, we find even when they're under sort of 20, 21, it's harder to get those patients pregnant. So if your body mass index is very low, number one, you, you need to seek medical attention because that could be important for your overall health. 
Number two, it's gonna reduce your success rates. And number three, and we didn't put the chart up because it's kind of hard to see with the graph that they had in this article, but they actually have what's called the J-shaped curve. And what that means is that when your body mass index was very low for miscarriage rates in particular, the miscarriage rates when your body mass index went low also went up, and then they went up quite considerably when your body mass index is higher. So there is a sweet spot in terms of your weight where too thin is not good and too heavy is not good. When you're in that normal range, you're gonna get the best chances in terms of reducing your miscarriage rate. So the fact or fiction this week was, can we accurately predict what kind of an impact your body mass index will have? And based on almost a million cycles worth of data, we can. We can predict it right down to the number and you can find out your own category based on your body mass index and adjust with these numbers to be able to tell you exactly where you're gonna fit. Now, we didn't incorporate this into our just recent video uh, called Embryo Math, and you'll find that again right up there on the link uh, on our YouTube channel where we break down bit by bit how you get from deciding you wanna do IVF to what you should expect in terms of your success rates, because this wasn't even available when I started the process for that video. Um, but this can be included into that calculus and you can do it on your own with the data we've provided you here. This video will be up on our YouTube channel shortly and so you guys will be able to see it there and, and reference it if you need to. So it is a fact, no question, that the body mass index can actually help you predict both your clinical pregnancy rate, your live birth rate, and your miscarriage risk. And for those of you who are struggling with it, it is not fair for people to tell you to just go lose weight. Any fertility center worth their salt will definitely say to you, we can work with you, we can offer you options, we can help you along the process, we're there to support you through it, and we do that. We have a nutritionist here. I talk to my patients about an appropriate healthy diet. We don't talk about dieting because I don't like telling people they need to go on a diet. We talk about eating healthy. We talk about exercise regimens and how to do that. And those are all critical elements of this. I never tell someone just go lose weight. We talk to patients about what their risks are, how it's gonna impact their success rates and what we can do with them along the way to support them on that, that sort of process to get them to a point where we optimize and maximize their success rates. So if we can help you, don't hesitate, reach out to us, we will. That's what we're all about. So thank you for joining us for this exciting fact or fiction. And uh, again, we always love suggestions. So if you have an idea you want us to bring up on a topic for next week, don't hesitate, send us a, uh, an idea and we will definitely bring that up. Don't forget to give me some ideas for Valentine's Day. And uh, thank you all for joining us. We're gonna start the live question segment and we do have lots of questions that were asked in advance. So Tarek's gonna read them out and I'm gonna answer. <laughs>